Martin, thank you for that generous introduction. And I, I want to say he's very modest because he played such a foundational role in creating this institute. It was your vision and your entrepreneurialism that made it possible. And I'm very happy to say that I think just about every director, with one exception, is here because we've got a Kurt Organista, David Montecano, you're here. Uh, Lisa is here. I'm here, so we make sure the roof stays intact here because this is a lot of the Latino leadership on campus. So, in addition to thanking Martin, I also want to thank Lisa Garcia Veroya, Christina Lash, and the staff here at the Center for Latino Policy Research for all that they've done to make this event a success. And I also want to thank the co sponsors, the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, Martin, also the Center for the Study of Law and Society, Roseanne Greenspan is here, the Henderson Center for Social Justice, Mary Louise Frampton is here, and the Chief Justice Irwin Institute on race, ethnicity, and diversity for supporting this event. And finally, I want to thank all of you in the audience. I know that your time is precious and that you're very busy, and I'm grateful that you've come today to talk about what I think is one of the great, important issues of our time, and that is the educational attainment of Latino students. And this kicks off a series that will address those issues, and so hopefully this will just be the beginning of a number of conversations on these issues. Now, when I was asked to speak, I thought, well, it's wonderful to be returning to Berkeley and to have a chance to brainstorm with you. But I also wanted, because of this recent event in my life, to weave throughout my account of the statistical picture of Latinos in schooling and the structural challenges that they face in the educational process to weave into that my own experience, which often resonates with those statistics and those studies that I'm going to talk about. So let me begin with the elementary school years and the secondary school years. When I was an elementary school student, I was walking down the hall one day when I overheard a teacher say, such a bright girl, too bad there's no future for her. Even then, I knew that her prognosis was all wrapped up in perceptions of my Mexican ancestry and identity, a status that would leave me on the outside looking in, whatever my abilities or efforts might be. But what I don't think that teacher appreciated when she made that remark was how devastating it felt to be written off before I had reached eight years of age. But the truth is America was a greater country than she had imagined. At night, I would go home to watch scenes from around the nation on what was then a new remarkable invention called television. And I saw the images of people chanting, being pulled apart, and coming back together facing down force by meeting violence with nonviolence, and in the process, demanding that America live up to its promise as a democracy rooted in principles of equality and liberty. As a child, I did not realize, well, this is the next generation speaking out already. Great. And so as a child, I did not realize that those brave individuals would change my life by redefining the structures of opportunity through social activism and legal struggle. These efforts would remake the parameters of my future, making it possible for me to stand here today as Dean Designate of UCLA School of Law. The, the process of social change takes time. And in the meanwhile, there were other people who reached out to me, nurtured me, and helped me to love learning for its own sake. They prepared me for the future that might lie ahead. So at the same time that this teacher was bemoaning my fate, I had another teacher, Mrs. Lola Clevenger, who basically convinced me that I had potential. She instilled in me an excitement about ideas, and she made me feel that I fully belonged in her second grade class. At a time when I wondered about my place at school, she reached out and showed me how I could transcend the pettiness of that moment by transporting myself with books and projects. I don't think we ever forget the people who mentor us when we need it the most. I certainly haven't. And when I won a Distinguished Teaching Award here at Berkeley, when they asked me about my role models, Mrs. Clevenger was the one who came to mind because she had shown me that for each and every one of us, learning is a search for meaning and a validation of who we are and why we are here. When I was asked about my own teaching style, I knew that any success that I had enjoyed st 
stemmed from that early experience of connection and possibility. It wasn't just the information that was transmitted. It was the relationship that was formed. And so I wrote that though there are times when I am tired and when I fail, at my best moments of teaching, I reach out to the sad, lonely child in each of us, still searching for Mrs. Clevenger. Now, much has changed since the days of the civil rights battles of the 1960s that came into my home on television. But there is no doubt that having motivated teachers and mentors at an early age still matters deeply. Latino students today often live in segregated neighborhoods in households that are marked by poverty. These may be loving homes, but parents often have low levels of educational attainment that prevent them from sharing information about the pathways to school success and higher education. In some cases, language can be an additional barrier to participation, and immigration status can leave parents feeling vulnerable and ill-equipped to speak out on behalf of their children. At times, families may plant the seeds of aspiration, but not know exactly how to cultivate these seeds so that they grow into academic attainment. In their book, Dream and Color, Linda and Loretta Sanchez, who are now both representatives to the United States uh, Congress, and I think this is unprecedented to have two sisters in the House of Representatives, recall how their parents nurtured their hopes for the future. Loretta remembers that one of her father's favorite sayings was, don't let anybody ever tell you, you're a dumb Mexican. She now realizes that as an immigrant to the United States with limited education and Spanish as his first language, her father must have heard that over and over. When Loretta received a school assignment that stumped her, despite their limited schooling experience, both of her parents stepped in to help her think about solutions. And her project was a tremendous success. In that moment, she learned an important lesson. She writes, if you defeat yourself, nothing will get done. But if you remain calm, look at every possibility, and work with other people, you're sure to come up with a solution. Even so, when the time came to make decisions about college, Loretta's parents could not offer her concrete advice since neither of them had attended college themselves. And so she was left to rely on a guidance counselor who was not particularly committed to being sure that Loretta made the most of her opportunities. Today, Latino's educational success continues to depend on early intervention, high quality teachers, and systems of mentoring and support. According to a study of a universal preschool program in Oklahoma, Latinos benefited more than any other group from access to this early enrichment experience. But for these effects to endure, these students must find up in elementary and secondary programs that also are strong. Yet Latinos now are the group most likely to attend schools that are hyper-segregated by race, ethnicity, and poverty, and they tend to be taught by teachers with less impressive credentials in schools with fewer resources than those attended by their white peers. Latino students are twice as likely to be poor as white students and more likely to grow up in the most intensely poverty-stricken families. As a result, Latino children suffer from the effects of material want, and I think here particularly of access to health care and good nutrition. Indeed, when I went to elementary school in Calexico, California, I remember that many of my Latino classmates showed up hungry. I could hear their stomachs growling until mid-morning when trays of, with cartons of milk arrived. They were part of a federal nutritional program and, I guess, our own childhood version of a coffee break. Now, after we had our milk, the classroom felt different when the hunger pangs had stopped. And I suspect that the learning process felt different, too. The Latino population is the fastest growing in the United States, but it continues to lag behind in educational attainment. Between 1987 and 2007, the number of Latino students in public schools doubled from 11% to 21%. And the Census Bureau predicts that by 2021, one in every four pupils in the United States will be Latino. 
the future is already here in states like California and Texas, where approximately half of the public school students are Latino. Now, with this growth, unfortunately, has not come progress in educational attainment. So in 2005, only 58% of Latinos graduated from high school on time, compared to 78% of whites. And this disparity correlated with an ongoing achievement gap as measured by standardized tests in reading and mathematics. So according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, 86% of Latino eighth graders scored below grade level in reading as compared to 62% of white eighth graders in 2007. I should add, those statistics are alarming because of the high levels of the low grade performance for all students, but the picture is particularly stark for Latinos. Now, these numbers reveal that a growing segment of the population, and in California, the single largest racial or ethnic group, is not developing the human capital that will be necessary to fuel an economy predicated on technology and complex services. Faced with these facts, the state, sadly, has disinvested in the education of Latinos and honestly, I think, all public school children in kindergarten through 12th grade. And with this disinvestment, we can hardly count on the opportunities for preschool that we know are so important. Now, these developments certainly hurt all students, but they hurt the most in less affluent districts that have fewer options to fill the gap. So the first problem I think that is a major problem has been the loss of our commitment to education as a pathway to opportunity in the state of California. But that is not the only obstacle, because today, Latinos are by some measures the most segregated population in America. And this is occurring at a time when federal courts have retreated from desegregation decrees. And worse yet, a recent United States Supreme Court decision has made it difficult for local communities to adopt even voluntary integration plans should they have the political will to do so. A third major obstacle is that the state has adopted policies that hamper the school's flexibility to deal with the needs of Latino students. So not only are teachers and administrators struggling with fewer resources, they have less discretion in determining how to use them. An example of this is Proposition 227, which mandates a single approach to addressing the needs of English language learners, which is, by the way, a substantial segment of the Latino student body, which in turn limits a teacher's ability to tailor programs to particular children's individual needs. Finally, there are fewer avenues for parents to participate in educational decision making about their children. We do not anymore see the kinds of aggressive support for parental involvement in federal legislation that we once did. And the federal courts have narrowed the ability of parents and children to bring private lawsuits to enforce their entitlements in education. Now, I acknowledge that all of these obstacles, both separately and cumulatively, are pretty intractable in the current budgetary climate. But the truth is, whatever the problems in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., I believe there are things you can do right now as individuals to make a difference. And those things matter to the particular people whom you help. So the first thing that I think we need to do is publicize these issues through the outlets that are available to, to us. And I congratulate the Center for its sponsorship of this series, which is a step in that direction. But I do believe we need to reach beyond the academy to the general public. And there are many ways to do that. You can write up ads, you can do blogs, you can use all kinds of outlets to get out the word about these issues. Now, another thing that each of us can do is to mentor someone who needs your help. All of you here at Berkeley are, by definition, highly successful academically. You are sophisticated. You have access to resources that many others may not. And while mentoring is important in elementary and secondary school, and I'm very proud to say that we have a, a Latino student organization at UCLA Law School that every year sponsors an outreach event 
to high school students in the Los Angeles area, it's also important to mentor the people here at Berkeley on this campus who are arriving and can benefit from what you have to share. There is a recent article in the Harvard Education Review called Results Not Typical, One Latino Family's Experiences in Higher Education. And the article describes the experience of Ricardo Jimenez, who was the son of immigrant parents. He talks about how he struggled at UC Irvine until he joined an organization called Mexican American Engineers and Scientists, or MAES. Ricardo had been on academic probation, but by joining peers in study groups, looking at previous tests and notes that other club members had, and enjoying their company as friends and colleagues, he was able to stay in the engineering program and graduate. He describes joining MAES as, quote, the turning point of my academic focus at UCI, end quote. And he highlights the importance of having a mentor who understood the balance he was trying to achieve between his work, his family obligations, and his studies. Ricardo's story shows that you can be a resource and make a difference in someone's life. Now, third, I think, and despite these difficult odds, I think that you know, community groups, educational organizations, and civil rights advocates must continue to press for reform. And I want to give you an example. The Obama administration has put unprecedented monies into education, and I think that is laudable. But a lot of the money is tied up in a program called Race to the Top. And if you look at the results of the two competitions, in the first competition, only two states received grants, Delaware and Tennessee. And in the second round, awards were made to the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, and Rhode Island. Now, New York and Florida are high immigrant receiving states with significant Latino populations. But notably missing from this list is the western half of the United States, if you don't count Hawaii. And in particular, California and Texas have not received any support through this program, even though these two states together educate about half of all Latino, uh, Latino students in the nation. So if there's 41 million in the nation, about 20 million are in California and Texas. So if the Latino educational crisis is to be addressed in a meaningful way, the solutions have to begin in states like California and Texas where we are educating the bulk of Latino students. Now I talked a little bit about elementary and secondary education. The problems, of course, at that level are compounded when we reach college and beyond. So one of the problems is that there is not that much support for the critical transition from high school to college that Latinos make, assuming that they are able to graduate. They're among that 58% or so who finish. Now, as I mentioned before, in her memoir, Loretta Sanchez describes the lack of counseling she received about choosing a college and seeking financial aid, even though she was a gifted and highly successful student. And her story is not an isolated one. I myself received advice about going to college, not from my high school guidance counselor, but fortuitously from Dr. Edmund Deaton, who was the director of a summer program in mathematics, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. If Dr. Deaton had not taken an interest in me, I very much doubt that I would have applied to Stanford University. In fact, he not only suggested that option to me, but insisted on meeting my parents to share his views on why this mattered so much. Dr. Deaton's advice was critically important to me in making strategic choices that I did not fully understand at the time. Only after I arrived at Stanford would I come to appreciate the intensely hierarchical nature of higher education. Apparently, many Latinos are in a similar situation. According to a 2010 study, Latino applicants often had academic credentials that would have permitted them to enroll in colleges and universities that were more competitive than the ones that they actually chose. But even though Latinos were, in some sense, overqualified for the institutions they attended, they nonetheless have lagged in college completion rates. This problem is particularly serious at less competitive institutions where there are already low overall rates of graduation. 
In fact, at the bottom 10 schools, only 17% of Latinos matriculated within a six-year period after enrolling. But even at selective institutions, like this one, there is a gap, although the overall graduation rates are considerably better. So here at the University of California at Berkeley, 88% of white students graduate within six years, but only 79% of Latinos do, a gap of 9%. Now, an even bigger problem in California than this is that many Latinos do not enroll in four-year institutions. They are enrolling in two-year rather than four-year colleges, and then they never transfer to an institution where they can receive a bachelor's degree. Now, this is in part an artifact of state policy. The state made a decision to focus its growth efforts on community colleges. So in the late 1990s, California added 800,000 seats to two-year institutions. But expansion at four-year institutions has largely come to a standstill. And I think if you think about recent enrollment cuts and efforts to bring in out-of-state students, the squeeze that you see is only going to go in the other direction, where it will be smaller. Now, reflecting this trend, the bulk of Latinos currently in California attending a higher institution are in the community colleges. So the number of Latinos who enrolled at a four-year institution in California in 2005 was only 20.3%, so about one in five enter a four-year institution. But what is more chilling is that all of those other Latinos who enrolled in community college faced very long odds of transferring. Fewer than 8% transferred to a four-year institution. According to a recent college board survey, our country now ranks 12th among developed nations in the number of 25 to 34-year-olds with college degrees. Once upon a time, we were first. President Obama has expressed a desire for the United States, once again, to assume its place at the top of the list. So far, his administration's reforms have focused on the student loan programs and increasing Pell Grants. But, and I think those are important steps. I, I think they're very important in helping people to finance higher education. But I don't think America can be number one again unless some measures are specifically targeted at the Latino population. And I want to talk in particular about the idea of grading institutions, rating them, not just on how many students they enroll, but how many students they graduate. And several scholars have suggested that the designation as a Hispanic serving institution should turn on some notion that you are actually graduating Latino students in substantial numbers once they're enrolled. And of course, if you were designated that way, federal funds could flow to you as a result. Now, the situation in California is especially urgent because, as Martin Carney writes in a recent report for PACE here at Berkeley, without an improvement in Latino college graduation rates in the state, California's economy could suffer down the road, making the state government's future financial problems even worse. I mean, I didn't even think that was possible, but apparently Martin Carney says it is if we don't start educating our Latino student population. Now, the post-war promise of California was rooted in higher education as a critical engine of economic expansion. But that promise is fading, just as Latinos need it the most. Demographics alone cannot account entirely for the shift. For example, the state of Texas has the second largest number of Latino students, but it currently seems to be adopting this very model of higher education as a component of economic growth that California is dismantling. And it does seem to me that the polarized politics that have led to initiatives that lock in ill-considered policies must take part of the blame for the situation in which we find ourselves. These hard truths have consequences for Latino participation in graduate and professional schools. A 2006 report by UCLA's uh, Chicano Studies Research Center found that for every 100 Latino children who begin school, 54 graduate from high school, 11 graduate from college, and four will pursue a graduate or professional education. One will get a doctorate. 
By contrast, for every 100 white children who begin school, 85 will graduate from high school, 26 from college, and 10 will pursue graduate or professional education, although again, only one gets a doctorate, interestingly. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, these disparities are even more striking when you make the comp comparison between whites and Chicano students, students of Mexican origin. So as the incoming dean of UCLA School of Law, I have to grapple with the fact that enrollments of students of Mexican origin in law schools across the country has stagnated in recent years, even as the population grows by leaps and bounds. As a result, in California, Latinos make up 3.7% of all the lawyers in California, even though they make up 32.4% of the state's population. So you can really see the gap there in representation. Now, I don't want to say that there hasn't been progress since I was in school, because there has. Um, when I went to uh, Yale, I was actually the only person of Mexican origin in my entering class. And I joined a group that was called LANA, Latinos, Asians, and Native Americans, because there were not enough of us to feel <laughs> separate organizations. In fact, we could all sit around a table like that. And just as a side note, the co-chair at the time that I entered Yale was a third-year law student whose name you may recognize, Sonia Sotomayor, the first Latino justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, her high-profile success and that of others, I'm thinking here, for example, of Tom Science of Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, another Yale graduate, uh, Linda Sanchez, the representative to Congress, who I'm proud to say is a UCLA law graduate, and many others show how far Latinos have come in the legal profession. And the good news is that though the numbers are small, the Latino attorneys are doing very well by all accounts. In California, it's also clear that when Latinos practice law, a lot of them are doing it in LA. So over half of all the Latino attorneys in this state are practicing law in the Los Angeles area, compared to one third overall who practice in that area. Now, based on a survey that former Supreme Court Justice and now law professor Cruz Reynoso did, and I should, in the interest of equal time, say he's a Berkeley Law graduate, um, he found that Latino lawyers have achieved considerable success and are highly committed to giving back to their communities in a variety of ways. And I think the good news for me as a dean is that they're also very engaged with their law school alma maters. Um, and indeed, uh, recently, I attended an annual gala and scholarship awards ceremony sponsored by the Mexican American Bar Foundation in Los Angeles. And every year, the amount of money that they are raising for scholarships has grown. And they are supporting many law students, I'm happy to say many at UCLA. Um, and the turnout that night was spectacular, with leading attorneys from all sectors of practice, judges and other public officials, deans and professors, as well as students and their families. And I left feeling so affirmed by that event, because I knew that this was an example of the mentoring and support that one generation can offer the next. And I certainly felt energized at that point as a dean designate to see the level of support in the Latino community for Latino law students. So let me say in closing that I think in the end, investment in education generally and higher education in particular is an act of optimism. It demonstrates a faith in the future and in the possibilities of coming generations to achieve even more than their parents and grandparents have. Lately in the media, there have been comments that America has lost its mojo, that it has gone from being a can-do country to a make-do nation. There's some notion that we simply can't afford high-quality education anymore. It's too expensive. Unfortunately, we may later discover that we paid a very high price because we confused a necessity with a luxury. Latinos have a special stake in this debate as a young population dependent on education to prepare for work and citizenship obligations. But the stakes are high for everyone. We must make sure that our nation remains competitive in an increasingly global market for human capital. Together, we can work to preserve educational opportunity, and we can recognize that Mojo is not something handed down from on high but a power we find within ourselves. Thank you.
Do you want to? Sure. Oh, do I? Well, I, okay, great. I'm, I'm happy to do that, however you want to do it. I have a question. Um, my name is Sonia Diaz, and I'm a first-year law student at Bolt. My question to you, as incoming dean of UCLA, what are the pathways to law school for students in California that are now faced with high tuition, ranging from forty to forty-four thousand, going up to fifty, or private school, which is just about that much? You know, we're very limited with the UC fee increases and budget cuts. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the position in terms of trying to navigate an elite law program with the needs of California that you just outlined? So the economic stability is dependent on the female growth in healthcare. Mm -hmm. so yes, I mean, I do think this is a very important point and one that I will have to grapple with. The first thing that I hope is that people who graduated in an earlier time will be willing to support the current generation of law students. These are individuals who got their legal education at a remarkable bargain price and have done very, very well. And I think getting the word out about these increases and their impact on students is incredibly important. Um, so scholarship aid. Also, those fees do need to go back in part to student support, and there's a mandated minimum that has to do that, but I think the goal should be to exceed that minimum. Um, and thirdly, the federal government has been taking steps to address some of the issues around student loans, and I think that's an important development, particularly with respect to loan forgiveness. And so I do think there are measures. I don't think that there will be a solution overnight. Um, one thing, though, that I do expect to do is to take a fresh look at any proposed future increases given the current conditions in the law market and make sure that they are justified. And if not, I think we need to revisit whether or not the escalator that we built is still the right one to have. So I do promise a fresh look at that in my own capacity when I'm actually being. Um, Nice to see you again. Yes, nice to see you too. Um, I'm just, just speculating here and now. I never gave it a thought. Which is, what about any claiming that this issue no longer white in school? That, is that just a kind of a, a separate path that leads into a kind of scholarly you know, acquisition? Right. Something that can be leveraged in the classroom and right. mentorship laterally? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, this is an interesting question about acquisition of foreign languages by English-speaking students in school. And what we do know is that right now, with California's policy under Proposition 227, students have to be instructed overwhelmingly in English if they speak a language other than English. Um, there are charter schools that have adopted dual immersion programs which allow students to learn in a two-way setting. So a Spanish-speaking child is learning English as an English-speaking peer is learning Spanish. But by definition, those have to be the exception rather than the rule because they're limited to the charter school experience. One interesting problem, I think, is that the commitment to foreign language instruction has declined somewhat in general. Um, so I actually am a senator of Phi Beta Kappa, and one of the things we struggle with is making the schools have a foreign language requirement for eligibility to be elected to Phi Beta Kappa because increasingly there's less emphasis on foreign language acquisition even in higher education. So it's an interesting uh, problem. Um, in your beginning anecdote, you talked about being disparaged as a white girl and, you know, throughout the disparagement in ethnic and racial terms. But I wonder if you could say something about the girl part and about Latinas. Yes. Um, Right. And I do want to say it was disparaging. I think he was actually meant to be sympathetic. Okay. Um, you know, I think she felt sorry for me. Right. You know, to be trapped okay. in intelligence like that, right? <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I think that what's very interesting about the data we have on Latinos is that Latinos are really doing better in higher education and education more generally. Um, and when you look at college graduation rates for Latinos, you break them down by gender. Women uh, uh, who are Latinos, they're graduating at about the same rate as whites are, um, white males. But it's Latino males who are having more trouble with their educational access and attainment. And no one really understands why there is that gender gap. Um, you see a similar gender gap in the African-American community. 
Um, and I think researchers just haven't figured out why that is since these are brothers and sisters who often grew up in the same households with the same parents, the same level of resources, and yet the women are doing better. And so I actually think that that's a very important area of study to figure out why it is that there is this gender gap in these communities of color. Hi. Um, I have a question about, uh, I guess, immigration status and the way that affects the issue of gender and Latina and Latina students and how you make that frame to the goals of higher education. Yes. Well, the well, one of the things that's very interesting is that we know that the law has played an important role in protecting immigrant children. Plyler versus Doe is a landmark case that said that you could not exclude children from public education, elementary and secondary education, based on undocumented status. And the concern here was that if you were to do that to children, you would relegate them to a permanent underclass that would stay on in the United States, live here, but without the opportunity to participate meaningfully in the economy or our political life. And what's very interesting is actually someone went back and traced the children who brought this action, who were the, the plaintiffs and fire, and they did stay in the United States. And some of them did actually graduate from college. But what has happened is that although this is on the books and still good law, it, it is, there are increasing problems of having this protection subverted in practice. So there was a big scandal recently in the Chicago public schools where administrators were demanding that parents provide proof of a birth certificate of, that would show citizenship or proof of permanent resident status, legal uh, status, which would in effect preclude students who were undocumented from attending. And so I think one of the difficulties is we're finding that because there's been a fairly strong, visible anti-immigrant sentiment, some of that is filtering into school practices. Um, we also saw the recent experience in Arizona, um, which has, I think, created a climate of fear about how immigrants will be treated. Um, so one of the things that we have is law on the books, but we've got to have the resources and make sure that it's actually enforced. The other area in higher education is the Dream Act. Um, and I know that one of the, one of the very first uh, AB 547 students has graduated, I think, at Berkeley. Uh, there's one who just graduated. I went to the uh, graduation ceremony for the Latino students at UCLA. The first AB540 student had graduated, but even when you graduate, if you're able to finance your education through private support, since no public support is available, you're not able to work. And so, you know, there are a whole set of issues around that. Um, and so I think that's another area of continuing controversy. Um, so it is complicated. The other thing that I just wanted to mention is that in, one of the things that's happened is the Latino community is increasingly dispersed. And so there are towns that never had the number of Latino students that they currently have. And so we're beginning to see people use proxies for identity in an exclusionary way. So there's recently a case in Dallas where um, a parent came in to complain that the, her children were being put in special programs for English language learners when they were not English language learners, and it had turned out to be a way to segregate recent Latino, Latino immigrant students in this district that had no experience in dealing with the immigrant uh, population that was arriving. So it's a complex set of issues. Thank you for your question. Um, I wonder, it's so exciting that you're taking on this wonderful thank thank you. And I wonder, you know, what kind of impact do you want to have as the next team at UCLA Law School? And if you've had a chance to sort of think about what some of your top priorities will be while you're there? Yes. Well, I'll tell you, first of all, I'm the dean for the entire school. So a lot of my priorities will be about making sure that the educational process is as high a quality it can be, that students feel welcome, that they feel engaged. But I do feel that intergenerational mentoring is important, not just for Latino students, but for all students. Because people who are out there in our alumni base, which is remarkable, I must say, you know, we have such highly distinguished alumni doing incredibly important things who are very concerned about the school and the community, that I think that by sharing their experience, by being available to create social networks, not just for Latino students, but for all students, that would be incredibly important. 
But it's also the case that before the end of affirmative action at the UC under 209, we graduated at UCLA some of the most powerhouse Latino lawyers in the state. And I think that it's very interesting to see this generation of our alumni coming into their own as leaders. And, and it's just very exciting. And so I think that it keeps people motivated, keeps the morale up that, you know, I have the possibility to do something remarkable with my law degree. And this is another reason why financing is important. You don't want people to lose that set of options. Um, so I'm very excited to be part of a community as distinguished as that. Um, and so I imagine there will be a lot of leadership coming from the alumni and the students. And, and of course, the faculty always have ideas, too. So I, I want to be open to all of that. But I just see public law schools as having a special obligation. They should be producing citizen lawyers. Lawyers who are fabulous professionals, but also remember that they have obligations. Law is not just something there on the books. It's not something just for certain sectors. Law is the architecture of our society. It is the way that we express our common civic identity for better or for worse. And so I think public law schools have a special role to play. And indeed, uh, Henry Wysoski wrote a book called The University and Owner's Manual, described the benefits of universities for their local communities, I think that they're public universities, and he said investing in these kinds of institutions is like an act of local patriotism. And so I would like to keep that ethic of the citizen lawyer alive. It was the theme of my AALS presidency, transformative law, and I believe law still has the potential to do important things, and certainly law changed my life. Thank you. It's a great you. honor yeah. to see you get to that place and um, look forward to seeing how you're going to manifest that with that networking. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, um, just in terms of, you, you mentioned these diversities with the gender gap, but is that translating to any kind of benefit for the larger Latino public, um, the community, in terms of like, translating any kind of benefit, or is it just a reconstruction of the same thing, but different, but more like you know, in that professionalism? You mean in terms of the gender gap? Because I, well, yeah. Yeah, more technically, like, do they gain more benefit in terms of the economically? Like, uh, well, I know the lawyers are doing well. <laughs> because one of the things that uh, Cruz and Nessa did in this survey was to, to sort of take a look. And, you know, Latino lawyers are in every sector of practice in LA, from big firm to medium to small to public interest to government. There are a disproportionate number of Latinos, interestingly, in the criminal justice system as prosecutors and public defenders. But you have a, a group of Latino lawyers now in LA that is just remarkably successful in every sector, and it's been sort of a quiet revolution. You know, they don't necessarily go out and get in the papers, but they're out doing civic work, they're making a good living, they're very highly qualified professionals. And my own sense is that there are the elements there to help to create a Latino legal agenda for the future because like, you know, Los Angeles has this incredible concentration of talent. It's a global city. And I do feel in some ways it is the Latino Mecca, right? And truly, if you don't have Latino leadership in Los Angeles in the legal community, where are you going to find it? So part of the excitement for me is that I see so many Latino attorneys who are dedicated to making a better future. And I think they look at what's happened with, for instance, the enrollments I talked about, and particularly at UC Law Schools, the decline in enrollments. And they want to make sure there's a pipeline of people to keep going, to, to keep the agenda alive for Latino representation, for Latino voice, and for participation. So. That's the inspiration for me, is to see people doing all of that. Because no one person can do it alone. Right? I, I will have a certain position, but I can't do it by myself. I can't make the law school run by myself, much less 
take on issues of this magnitude, but I can admire people who do it and do it well and sustain that effort no matter how difficult it is. And I see a lot of people like that in the uh, Los Angeles legal community from all parts of that community. So it's, it's really inspiring. And that's one of the things I'm looking forward to about the job is meeting all these really high-powered people with a vision. So. Well, I want to just say thank you for coming. I know it's this incredibly hot day, and we're <laughs> all wondering when can we get a drink, a beverage. Um, but I just wanted to say I want to congratulate all of you for your commitment, for your success, and I know that each of you in your way will help to contribute to solutions to the issues I've discussed. And they are intractable, but that doesn't mean in some small way you can't reach out to someone and really make a difference. It can be someone like Ricardo, it could be someone like me. And you will make a lasting impression for the good. And I think when you add all of that up, it, it actually is pretty important. So never feel that you can't do anything. You have the power within yourself to do important things. And I hope that you will exercise that power that you have for good and I think you'll find it very fulfilling and rewarding as well. So I wanted to thank you for taking the time to be here and listen. And I look forward to the further conversations that I know that the center is going to have under Professor Garcia Rodriguez's leadership. Thank you.